Hey everybody, welcome back to Whiteboard Finance. My name is Marco and I'm here to help you master your money and build your wealth. In today's video, I'm going to show you seven different finance books that will change your life completely if you take the time to read or listen to them. These seven finance books definitely changed my life and they gave me a roadmap to build a successful future for myself and my family. So the format that we're going to present these books in is pretty simple. I'm basically going to uh, dissect these into three different ways. So out of the seven books, we're going to start with what it's about, who it's for, and then my takeaways from each one of these books. So you can see all the actionable steps that I got out of them. I'm not going to ruin the plot of the books. I'm just going to pick out one or two things that actually help me. So without further ado, let's get into it. So these books aren't in order of you know best to worst, but I definitely wanted to start with my favorite. So number one is going to be The Richest Man in Babylon by George S. Clayson or George S. Classen. Not exactly sure how to pronounce that last name. Uh, but basically, this is a fictional story about a king in the city of Babylon um, trying to make the rest of his subjects or the rest of the population of the city become as financially wealthy as the richest man in Babylon. So he calls the richest man in Babylon, asks him, hey, please do your civil duty and teach the rest of the people of Babylon on how to become as wealthy as you did. So he basically takes all these principles, the richest man in Babylon does, on how he became wealthy without coming from anything. He was not born wealthy. He was not born from a king or you know, someone that's super wealthy. He's just the guy that used these seven different principles on how to attain wealth and how to keep it. So basically, who this book is for is going to be for people that are looking for personal financial advice told in an engaging story. So the cool thing is, is that it's fictional, but it's told in a way that you can completely relate to it. Okay, And then also who it's for is for people that are looking for solid principles on how to acquire money, uh, manage money, and kind of how to keep your money and make your money grow. So it's very good for financial management. And then my takeaways, what I learned is, and just to keep the vein of you know, the whiteboard going, it's important to write these down. So one of the key takeaways was keep one-tenth of all you earn and pay yourself first. Okay, that's kind of where this concept of paying yourself first came from. I think it's from The Richest Man in Babylon because that book was written in the 20s. Uh, the second takeaway is work hard to improve your skills. That way you're always increasing your value in society, aka learning how to get paid more. And that way you can ensure a future income because wealth is the result of a reliable income stream. And then finally, number three for my takeaways from The Richest Man in Babylon is you cannot arrive at the fullest measure of success until you crush the spirit of procrastination within you. So don't procrastinate. So when you have a YouTube channel, Sometimes you can find yourself getting super lazy or demotivated, and this is my full-time gig. You know, I'm a full-time YouTuber, and I take a lot of pride in my work. Um, sometimes you procrastinate. Hey, your buddy invites you to the Browns game. Your buddy invites you to the Indians game. Either way, you got to not procrastinate, and you have to stay organized and on top of your um, job, whatever that may be. So number two is one of the best books ever created on studying millionaires, actual millionaires in the United States, and that's called The Millionaire Next Door. So this book is about showing you simple spending and saving habits and also telling you what to avoid, like buying new cars. And they back this up with all different percentages. So for example, 80% of America's millionaires are first generation rich. It's not like they inherited this money contrary to popular belief. 20% of millionaires are actually retired in this country and 50% of millionaires owned a business of some sort. So this isn't necessarily just you know running the next Microsoft or the next Apple or Facebook. A lot of these people are blue collar. They were plumbers, they were electricians, they were contractors. Um, a lot of the book studies, you know, immigrants as well. So this is super eye-opening because everyone thinks that you know, to be a millionaire, that means you make a million dollars a year and you, know, you drive Ferraris and Lamborghinis. Um, which is completely not true. So who is this book for? The Millionaire Next Door is pretty much for people that are already in the middle class or trying to get there. However, they want to be like stealth wealth, okay? And let me write that down because this is a pretty interesting term that I picked up recently. Stealth wealth 
is discussed in this book by the person having you know a million dollars in their retirement account or in their bank account or some sort of investment account um, and they drive a used Honda or a used Toyota or a used cargo van that they use for their contractor job, right? Um, so stealth wealth is kind of like the person that lives next door that has a million dollars that you would never guess, hence the uh, title, The Millionaire Next Door. So my main takeaways from this book is that they live well below their means, okay? Um, millionaire's budget, so I'll just draw like a little sheet here for budgeting, meaning that they know where their money is coming in and where it's going out, and they also plan their investments. Um, so I'll have like a brain here. Does that look like a brain or like a cloud? Maybe a walnut? Uh, <laughs> So anyway, uh, they plan their investments ahead of time and they don't make irrational decisions on following, um, oh, Bitcoin is blowing up, the stock market is blowing up, you know, you got to invest here, or here's the next big thing. They have a plan and they stick with it. And also, this pains me actually, <laughs> because they don't buy new cars. So I don't buy new cars, I would never advocate that you buy a new car, uh, but basically it's saying how most millionaires in this book owned used Hondas and Toyotas, they never bought new cars. And that's advice that I've advocated for on this channel for a long time. Number three is a book that I read while I was in college uh, a long time ago. <laughs> this one is called The Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham. Uh, Benjamin Graham, for those of you that don't know, is pretty much Warren Buffett's mentor, okay? And he's the one that created the concept, or not created, but followed heavily the concept of value investing. And if you can see that, that is probably following my face, but this says The Definitive Book of Value Investing. So this is also referred to as the Bible of investing. Uh, and what it's about is basically explaining how value investing works. Value investing is basically focusing on companies that are worth more or have higher intrinsic value than what their trading price currently is. So you're looking at long-term profits, you're ignoring the current market conditions, and you're just looking for winners or kind of that diamond in the rough. So for those of you that don't know, Warren Buffett is pretty much one of the most successful investors of all time, and this is pretty much um, the basis of his investment philosophy. So who is this book for? This book is pretty much for active investors who are looking to invest in individual companies or underpriced companies. Uh, if you believe in efficient market hy hypothesis where you know, the market is always uh, priced efficiently and all the prices are correct, then this doesn't necessarily apply, even though I wouldn't necessarily agree with that. This is still a great book to figure out um, you know, metrics and criteria on defining uh, undervalued companies. So my three takeaways from this book is pretty much um, there's three principles to investing. Let me write these down real quick. Uh, the first one is analyzing for long term. Okay, this isn't for people that are going to be swing trading or getting in and out of trades. Uh, the second is protecting yourself from losses. Okay, and then the third is sticking to a strict formula. So I'll just say having the discipline to know what your criteria is and sticking with that. Okay. The second takeaway was never trusting the market, okay? Because the market sometimes gets overpriced. So this isn't mentioned in the book, but I believe sometimes that the market gets blown up by bubbles because of social media. So look at like Bitcoin, for example, two years ago. That went through the roof because it was on LinkedIn, it was on MSNBC, it was on all over the TV and social media. So people get FOMO, which is fear of missing out. And that's why you can't necessarily trust the market on how things are priced. And also sticking to that strict formula gives you kind of like that discipline to be able to invest in what you believe in and what you know. So um, Warren Buffett, he's very famous for saying that he doesn't invest in companies that he doesn't understand. Um, and this is basically where I think he got it from, from the intelligent investor and sticking to his uh, investment formula and criteria. So next on the list at number four is not necessarily a finance book, but it kind of falls into this category. This is Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Um, this was also written a long time ago and has sold, you know, I believe millions of copies worldwide. Think and Grow Rich is essentially a curation of 13 common habits shared by wealthy and successful people. So this person, Napoleon Hill, studied 500 individuals over the course of 20 years and distilled their habits into those 13 things. So I'm not going to tell you necessarily what those are because I want you to read the book, um, but this book is essentially for people that are looking to get into the right mindset of being successful. Um, sometimes there's you know, certain people that are taught 
you know, you can't do this because of where you're from or where you're born or the color of your skin or your gender or whatever. That doesn't apply, okay? I know that's a, that's a reality in life, but if you follow these mindset tips, you can achieve pretty much anything, okay? So my, take, my three takeaways from this book, and I pretty much practice them until this day, are this. So the first one is building an unshakable belief in yourself, okay? This is pretty much having the confidence to present your opinion and not bending to you know certain people. So like if you look at the comment section of some of my videos, it's a disaster. Okay, it's a war zone. But you know if I I wouldn't have made the video if I didn't believe in what I was saying. So you know it's it's good to be courteous and to be nice. But you know at the end of the day, my positions I believe in them unless you can prove to me factually otherwise. Um, so believing in yourself. Number two is um, be. <laughs> So this is maybe the wrong way to word this, but be stubborn and stick to your decisions, okay? So sometimes if you know you're right, you need to be able to be a leader and stick with your decisions, okay? Sometimes, you know, everyone in the world, 99 out of 100 people may not agree with you, but if you know what you're talking about and you know what you're doing and you're confident, you know, you have to be kind of stubborn with sticking with your decisions. So say, for example, uh, my last video on Dave Ramsey and his credit cards, you know, most people love that video, but there's definitely, you know, I'd say one out of 10 people that completely disagreed with me. And that's okay. I believe in what I said in that video. And I believe I'm 100% correct um, because I presented a fair argument. Now, if you can actually show me proof as to why I'm wrong with certain things, I'm 100% all ears. And then number three is joining a mastermind. Okay, so mastermind is being with successful individuals that are like and similar to you, maybe working within your industry or where you kind of want to be. Um, so say, for example, I was just at a conference called FinCon. It was FinCon 2019. It was in Washington, D.C., and it was about 2,000 other financial bloggers, YouTubers, you know, podcasters, and it was almost like a really big mastermind or a conference of like and similar people. So I learned so much there and just I got to meet like Graham Stephan. I met Meet Kevin. I met Nate O'Brien, who I've already known. But there's just a lot of people there that, you know, whose opinion I respect and who I watch on YouTube. And it got me closer to these people. And we shared some ideas about YouTube and things like that. So definitely mastermind with where you're trying to go or where you want to be. So speaking of Dave Ramsey, uh, I'm going to recommend Dave Ramsey's Total Money Makeover. So I agree with pretty much 99% of what Dave has to say, um, credit cards not being one of them. However, most of the things that he talks about, I believe, apply to a great majority of the population, and it's a great way to live your life. So The Total Money Makeover is pretty much a book about how to get out of debt and also how to eliminate debt um, using small little steps called his baby steps. So you can build the financial future of your dreams using these seven baby steps. So I guess who this book would be for is kind of like beginners in finance or people looking to get out of debt and build that strong financial future. And just overall, it's a good way to live your life. So my main takeaways from you know, Total Money Makeover, um, I'd say the first one is getting $1,000 in your emergency fund. Sometimes being an entrepreneur, I just want to go 100 miles an hour and just, you know, spend all my money on building businesses or investing or, you know, checking out the next cool idea that my friend may have and giving him some cash to start up that idea. Um, however, you need to have $1,000 put away in an emergency fund. That way, it'll give you peace of mind to pay off debt, okay? So once you do that, uh, you can actually uh, start paying down that debt that you may carry beginning with the smallest all the way to the largest. He calls this basically his snowball method. Um, some people don't agree with this because they want you to pay off your highest interest rate debts first, um, regardless of the amount. But I still think that this is a great way to eliminate your debt. My wife and I actually did this. She had um, some student loans, a car loan, and also some credit card debt when, I, when we got married. And we just knocked all that out using the snowball method. And then finally, growing your emergency fund. So basically, um, once you pay off your debt, you're going to start adding to this thousand dollars till you get to three to six months of living expenses. Okay. So that's pretty much. It's not the entire total money makeover in a nutshell. It's only three of the steps. However, those are three important steps that I took away from the book. Okay. Number six is the Bogleheads Guide to Investing. 
Okay, this is written by two gentlemen, and it's based off of John Bogle's philosophy of investing. If you don't know who John Bogle is, he's the founder of Vanguard, um, pretty much the 800-pound gorilla in the room when it comes to uh, index funds, ETFs, you know, retirement accounts, things like that. So this was written by Mel Lindauer, Taylor Larimore, and Michael LaBeouf, uh, if I pronounced that correctly. And these people have a cult following. Uh, if you haven't already, check out the Bogleheads community online. Um, this book is basically a guide on how to invest your money written on the philosophy of Jack Bogle. Um, so the book basically starts with the basics of investing and gradually moves on to you know, intermediate and advanced topics. Um, they explain the ins and outs of each of these investments, but it's an overall philosophy for, and one for you to follow using kind of like the Vanguard products. So it's not like you know, a salesy book where it's like, hey, invest in XYZ, but it's got to be all in Vanguard. They do talk about that, but they talk about why um, this investing philosophy works. So this book is for the beginner to intermediate investor, and this is more for index fund investors, not necessarily active investors. Um, so my takeaway from this book was pretty much I've been investing with Vanguard uh, since I was 18 years old. So I didn't start investing with Vanguard because of this book. I picked this book up later, um, but this kind of solidified my, my choice, and it's kind of why I'm still with Vanguard you know, 13 years later at 31 years old. Uh, and then also I use um, a lot of their ETFs and their uh, target date funds. Okay, and then also some of their index funds as well. So a lot of the stuff that they mention in this book, I'm already personally invested in anyway, um, and vice versa. Sometimes I invest in stuff because of the book. Sometimes I just add more to my current positions um, because I heard about them in the book and I was already investing in them anyway. Okay, so number seven, I could not find my copy of. I don't know why. I must have given it away to someone or maybe someone just borrowed it and never gave it back. Um, but this is going to be Rich Dad, Poor Dad. If you haven't heard of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, you're probably living under a rock and you need to buy this book immediately. Um, so basically, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is about a, a kid growing up. It's actually about Robert Kiyosaki growing up. And he has two fathers, um, not like a stepdad, biological father situation, um, but basically a poor dad and a rich dad. So the poor dad is, you know, college educated, you know, goes to work eight to five, hard worker, believes in education, believes in, you know, the American dream of owning a home and all that. And then the rich dad is kind of like completely the opposite. He talks about um, owning assets over liabilities. So this book is perfect for the typical American consumer that only knows about, you know, swiping the credit card and incurring debt and purchasing liabilities as opposed to assets. So assets are things that bring money into your wallet. Liabilities are things that take money from it. Um, so this would be perfect for people that are looking to invest in real estate or just pretty much understand, hey, you know, the more assets I have, the, quickly I, the more quickly I can build wealth and the more quickly I can build passive income working for me to ultimately achieve financial freedom. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki primarily talks about real estate in this book, as I mentioned, and I do have um, a couple takeaways from this book. I ultimately invested in three rental properties because of this book, um, so I'll just call it like three houses. Um, I ultimately sold these just because I made some money on them and I didn't want to deal with those tenants just yet anymore. Um, I will ultimately get back into real estate, but not, not quite yet. Um, but that actually, this book spurred my interest in real estate at a very young age, okay? I also read this book when I was 18. It's an old book. Um, and then also, um, this book taught me how, he basically said how his wife, I'll draw a little Mercedes symbol. It's a big symbol. Can, you, can she even see? It's a convertible if you guys can't see that. Okay, this is like the wind blowing. This is her hair. This is terrible. Um, so her wife or his wife basically paid for her Mercedes using the cash flow from her assets. Okay, so from her rental properties or from the businesses that she owned. So he, he's a person that preaches, hey, you can have the finer things in life if you have the assets and the passive income to back it up and to pay for it. So that was an excellent takeaway from Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I highly suggest that book if you haven't seen it or read it already. So there you have it, everybody. Those are seven finance books to help change your life completely. If you follow the principles in those books, there is no excuse or no way that you will not become financially stable or financially wealthy. Um, the biggest thing with those books is actually sitting down and reading them. 
Uh, if you're not a reader, if you're kind of like me and you want to actually listen and turn your car into a classroom or your cell phone into a classroom, uh, check out the link below. Um, it's a link to Audible. It's Amazon's basically audiobook um, service. So if you sign up for that link, I get compensated at no additional cost to you. Um, and it's a great platform and you do get about one or two books a month using that. Uh, but don't quote me on that. So if you got uh, value out of this video, please send it to one friend who needs to become more financially literate. Uh, financial literacy is not taught in schools and I think that's intentional. Um, so help spread the word using these seven books and the link to this video. Thank you so much and as always, have a prosperous day. Credit cards are bad. Do not use the devil's plastic. You will go into debt forever. What? Really, Dave?